thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Doug Cook. I'm your host for tonight. I'm the Education Events Coordinator for NOFA Mass. And along with me is Anna Gilbert Muhammad, our Food Access and Webinar Coordinator. And she'll help field and focus some of the questions that you are all putting into the chat function as they come in. Before we get started, I'd like to thank all of the NOFA Mass board and staff who've contributed to the production of this webinar, the seventh in a series of free resiliency skills online gatherings. And a big thanks to our sponsors, Dr. Bronner's and New England Biolabs Foundation. Most importantly, we'd like to thank you, the viewers and listeners, especially our members who make our education and advocacy work possible. If you find this event useful and inspiring, please become a NOFA Mass member and make or, or make a donation to support our important work. I'm really excited to introduce our presenter, um, Elise Smith of Cedar Rock Gardens in Gloucester, Mass. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really appreciative of everybody looking for more knowledge and excited to get into their uh, gardens and we hope you enjoy the video and are certainly looking forward to helping to answer any questions that you have. So thank you and hello. Hi, welcome to Cedar Rock Gardens, um, owned by myself and my husband Tucker. We've been in business now for six years and we started the nursery up four years ago. So the nursery side of the business is um, seedlings, herbs, vegetables, and flowers, and we just added perennials this year, um, including natives and um, pollinator attracting flowers. Um, so behind me here, you can see all the seedlings laid out. Currently in this um, situation, we're doing just online orders for curbside pickup, um, but generally this is the shopping area. We have 300 foot greenhouses out back that we grow everything uh, under cover in and we start the majority of our plants from seed here and uh, Tucker will tell you about the farm side of things. Yes, yeah, so the farm we do a two acre market garden and we have about 10,000 square feet of indoor growing space that we continually grow 365 days out of the year in. Um, we operate uh, most of the farm is on clay, so we operate with a BCS tiller and a small tractor um, on that land. And for that, we provide to local markets as well as a 90 share CSA and farm stand. the BCS because it allows us to do minimal till as well as no till practices. Uh, with the BCS it is only about a 300 pound machine and we're able to run right over our bed um, and set a tiller anywhere from a half an inch to six inches deep. I've never set it any more than three inches deep. Uh, and it creates a nice bed. A lot of what we've been doing this spring is, would be classified as no-till. Uh, the ground has been so wet we haven't been able to use that BCS. So what we did last fall in preparation for our change in climate here in the Northeast, we raised all the beds up. And then that way this spring we were able to go through spread just compost and amendments on the beds, then take a four-pronged fork and fork the bed. And as we forked it, those cracks that were created in the soil, the compost and amendments can crack, uh, flow down through the soil and get into the sublayers of it. And as um, and then we go through and rake the bed out, and it's fully ready to plant at that point. And the reason why it's so beneficial, and especially in your own gardens, to have a low or no-till situation is because the soil is actually alive underneath what you're growing, and so you need to make sure that all of the uh, microorganisms in your soil are acting happily together. Um, a lot of 
really awesome soil work is actually done by all those tiny little worms that you find in your gardens and so the least amount of disruption you cause to them the better they are at their job of munching and decomposing the soil underneath your plants and um, they do a heck of a job better than we could really ever do so um, arm yourself with a fork a rake a scuffle hoe those things are going to be hands down the most useful tools we like raised beds because they drain really well they're easy to use so you can really just pull in row stop you can just pull in your bed sides it'll raise it up a little bit um, if ever you needed to do that uh, that's a really good way to do it with this rake here now if you've done this to your bed and you didn't really get a chance to plant it or cover it for I'd say probably any any longer than four days or so before planting it I would definitely go over it with a scuffle hoe so now that your soil is all amended and it's loose the weeds are very excited to take hold so what you want to do is go super super light you're really just trying to disrupt the very top of your soil so that you're just getting rid of any weeds on the top that have started to take shape and form. Uh, One of the major tools that we haven't mentioned that we use is a lot of landscape fabric and plastic silage tarps. And what we do is with land where there's a lot of crop debris or we are later in the season when we're not able to put a cover crop on the soil, um, will cover the soil with landscape fabric and silage tarps to prevent any erosion happening from that soil over the winter. As well as in the spring, we'll take those large sheets of plastic and we'll cover over our cover crops to kill them. And on a garden scale, you can use um, something like hay. Salt marsh hay is really easy to come by around here. Um, any sort of mulching you can do to really keep all the nutrients that you've been putting into your soil there so when it rains they're not just being um, drained out of your soil or, or pushed down into the groundwater so they're really available for your plants. Well you can see in our greenhouses it's a very diverse greenhouses usually production isn't done this way because it's not advantageous to have so many different crops that like different growing temperatures, different humidity temperatures together. But one of the added benefits of it is we have blooming crops right next to non-blooming crops. And so in the greenhouse, we're attracting all different kinds of bugs from outside. And as we're attracting all those different bugs, we're also attracting an environment that's working outside and it works also inside in this case. If you look right over here, see that guy there? That's a hoverfly. That's a native um, fly. It's giant, looks just like a honeybee. And this guy here, right here, is laying eggs on plants that it thinks that aphids are going to be attracted to later. And so, these hoverflies are in their natural environment. They lay the majority of their eggs on the wild nettle that we have surrounding the farm. And they'll lay those right underneath the leaf. And then when that egg hatches, the larvae emerge and they consume the aphid. So for the farmer and the home gardener to try and actually be um, producing a banker plant, what is what a lot of people refer to it as, is a plant that is actually a host for aphids. The nettle is a great one for that. The aphids love it. The aphids are actually like the base of the food chain of a lot of different bugs. See these brown aphids here? Those brown aphids there have gotten parasitized by wasps. And so a wasp, a small wasp, it's the size, you know, a little bit bigger than a pen tip, comes along and they insert their egg into the aphid. Their egg hatches and the larvae consume the aphid from the inside out. Over the years you're going to build up a 
ecosystem around this plant where you have these parasitizing wasps, you have the ladybugs, you have the lacewing come in later on in the season. Um, we have the hoverfly in this area as well and those will insert their eggs right along. Um, here's a hoverfly egg right there on the tip of the leaf. It's oblong or oval. Uh, there's another one there. And so when that hatches, that guy's just going to start consuming all these aphids. What we do on the farm here to, to encourage the parasitic wasp to keep on going is we actually pull all of our brassica stems out of the field instead of tilling them in and then we place them on the side of the field. The reason that we do that is because parasitic wasps overwinter in brassica stalks. And so if you're able to pull them out of your field instead of tilling them in, um, what that allows them to do is all those parasitic wasps to naturally just kind of hatch early in the spring and come out and start controlling aphids at that point of the year. You can always plant things to entice the pollinators to come. Pollinators are super important. They allow us to grow food. They, um, they're a massive part of our ecosystem here and so having them around is definitely necessary. Um, we plant a lot of things that are native to this area and they do well and so we don't have to do much work to keep them up or uh, maintain them necessarily except weeding. Um, so things like um, asclepies are really good for butterflies, um, for annuals a really awesome flower is uh, lissum. It's a low growing border plant, it smells like honey, the bees love it, the butterflies love it. Um, and that's actually something that you can interplant in your garden along with all your other vegetables because it's low growing, it doesn't take up space and it entices, it entices pollinators into your garden. Other perennials that we plant around here are uh, Joe Pie Weed. Nothing's really coming up quite yet, but um, uh, Beard's Tongue is a really good one that you can have. That's an early, early bloomer. Sedum is a really nice late bloomer. It's beautiful. It's red. It has an enormous amount of varieties that you can choose from that are not red. We love the red one. Um, a lot of pollinators of all sorts are attracted to the red color, which is nice if you like red. <laughs> um, other things that you can do in your marginal areas is just not mow. Um, things that come up in your grass are generally really beneficial to pollinators. Um, you can always uh, seed over your grass also with clover and that'll add a lot of really good um, pollinator beneficial action to your lawn or if you have a little marginal area you can spread some clover seeds and those are wonderfully abundant around here for sure and they grow really well and, and you don't really have to worry about maintaining them at all because they're, they're great when they're wild. Really the easiest thing to understand is you're going to want continual blooming in a diversity of plants in your landscape. There is no real golden ticket to alleviate all your problems. But the more diversity that you can have, the more balance of flowers in with your vegetables um, in a mixture of plant species, the, the less susceptible you are gonna be to plagues from um, disease and plagues from pests eating, your, eating all your crops. Thanks for coming. We enjoyed your visit and we hope that you have a great growing season. Anything came up during that, uh, that little video, you know, please go ahead and type in some questions and then we'll invite you to come off of mute and ask your question if that's something you want to do. Let's see. I have a few questions that have come through if you want them now. Yeah. Okay. So, um, one question was concerning cover crops. Do you leave the cover crops to feed the new crops? Yeah. So the cover crops, we generally pull, it's, um, 
it's like a big plastic tarp over the cover crop and we leave that for a couple of weeks and it kills everything so the root systems are a lot easier to work with and when we're forking the beds we're just sort of turning over the cover crop into the soil and that's going to add a lot of nitrogen to your soil. Okay, great. Uh, another question concerning attracting beneficial insects. When you attract the good insects, do you also attract the ones that are more pests? Yep, inadvertently, for sure. Um, we grow everything organically, and so the use of pesticides to us is um, very much limited or, or actually unavailable in our system. Um, so our pest tolerance is a little bit higher, um, not so high because we do sell the plants and of course we can't sell anything that has bad guys on it. But in the beginning of the season, um, we do have a sort of process of, we have these sticky cards in the greenhouses and we kind of do a count of how many bad guys are in the greenhouses. And usually, you know, the first couple of years we were doing this, the bad um, pests were definitely outnumbering and it was a little difficult. But now that we have an established population of beneficial insects. We're generally able to see the beneficials come in right around our, basically our tolerance level that has now been made up from just seeing how it goes every year. But yeah, inadvertently we're inviting the bad guys in so that the good beneficial bugs come in and have a food source. And generally they come in in, in way bigger numbers and they are able to control the bad pests. Okay, and staying in that category of um, uh, pests and beneficial insects, there was a question concerning the piles that you had for the wasp. What was in that pile again? So that was um, brassicas. That was last year's cabbage, uh, winter boar kale, Toscano kale, um, cauliflower was in there. Um, and I think that was about it, but mostly it was kale because that usually stays the most upright. Usually cabbage kind of uh, disintegrates, but yeah, if you have your kale overwintering, instead of throwing it in your compost pile, you can pile it right near your garden. Okay. And this is the last uh, question that came through, then we would love to hear your questions. Um, if you can explain a little bit more, how is turning over a cover crop different from tilling? So the, the turning over with a, with a fork, a pitchfork, is a little bit less abrasive to the soil system because um, when you're tilling, you're either, you're either turning the soil like this with your tiller, depending on the tiller you have, you're turning the top or you're actually tilling the entire garden bed over. So that's, it's basically just your, the area of surface that you're touching. So when you're forking it, it's four prongs that are going into the soil and you're turning over a bit. Um, usually it's like a big hunk that you're turning over. It's not like a massive disruption to the system. It's mostly the hunk you're turning over is intact and that system is intact. And you know, whatever you've picked it up from out of the bed is just what you're affecting. So it's, it's not, grinding and churning and and uh basically killing i mean you, you'd kill a lot of worms when you're tilling instead of forking doug that's all the questions i have um it's open for the floor is open for any others yeah well i was i was intrigued a lot about um how you use a lot of perennials in some of your cut flower production mm -hmm. Yeah, the perennials are great. Um, you know, because we have the nursery, seedling nursery and the farm, the spring is really um, nose to the grindstone, lots of work. And so anything that we can do to prevent us from working more is what we're going to lean towards. And so perennials are very low maintenance. Um, once they're established, uh, generally, it's just a couple weedings a year. It's not a lot of planting um, and on a garden scale, it's definitely nice to have really early flowers, which is what perennials are able to provide in our zone. We don't have a lot of annuals that are able to come up in the early spring. 
Um, and so perennials do a really good job of taking that lack of flowers and making it more of a reality on your in your garden or on our farm. Cool. And we we're wondering if you might have a list of, of the beneficial plants that you're using in particular. Um, yeah, so uh, Joe Pye weed is a really good one. That's, um, it's just a nice big plant, looks good. Um, we sort of have, I guess, a whole smorgasbord of them going on, but um, pretty much anything in the Asclepes family is going to do well around here and it attracts a lot of insects. Um, like I was saying in the video, a lot of red flowers attract um, butterflies, hummingbirds, bees. So, you know, you can do like pineapple sage is a really awesome herb you can have. It's culinary and it also attracts insects. Um, you can do columbine if you have shade. Um, gosh, there's, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to put together a list and I don't know if I can share it somehow through the website or um, I don't know if I can email it out to you, Doug, and you can share it with everybody. Yeah, and we can add it to a link onto our um, video when that goes online too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sweet. And I am going to take Anne and give the mic over to Anne. And you have the mic. Okay, great. I'm part of a community garden in Lowell, Mill City Grows. And the particular, we have eight community gardens, and the one I'm in has 42 raised beds. We have four compost bins and the first one is for very coarse things like the brassica stems uh, and we leave that to overwinter but it, we fill it up so at some point we have to empty it out and I'm wondering for the hoverflies uh, when do they hatch and is there sort of a sequence like do they hatch continually all year on I mean during the the warm seasons um, um, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what to do with that <laughs> yeah so they'll hatch I mean usually we start to see hover flies as early as like the first week in April mm -hmm. um, so yeah I guess to answer your question I mean Generally, we use the kale stalks because they're so abundant. We have so many of them. But if you have um, populations of plants around your gardens, there's going to be eggs in those plants as well. It's not necessarily just the kale plants that you have to keep around for in order to keep your beneficial yeah, over insects. Over winter. <laughs> yeah, so, so in the summer, we could take that pile away. And yeah and yeah. make it available for the next crops that are coming along. Okay, yeah. um, and I have so many questions, but I'll let somebody else take a chance and then I'll come back if there's time. <laughs> okay, yes, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, my question is, when you do the uh, cut and drop and no-till uh, techniques, and you leave a lot of um, residue in the field or on your beds, does that create harbors for and habitats for the pest as well as the uh, beneficials? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so it kind of depends on the pests that you're seeing in your gardens. Um, certainly some pests you want to for sure remove, like the uh, leaf miner, which attacks chard, beets, and spinach. If you have any leaf miner in your gardens, you certainly don't want to leave the debris of those plants to overwinter. Um, uh, the corn vine borer is another pest that if you see that attacking any of your plants, you want to get that plant totally out of your garden because that's something that will overwinter. Um, so it kind of depends on what your pest pressure is in your own garden. Um, even with the kale, it's kind of a balance because if you have a really serious flea beetle problem on your kale or your arugula, those are just little tiny black beetly looking bugs that attack um, the brassica family and, and they chew a lot of little holes in your leaves. If you have a really serious flea beetle problem, it wouldn't be worth keeping your brassicas in your garden to overwinter because that population wouldn't be controlled 
by the beneficials that you would be inviting with the plant. So you would want to just get rid of any of that. Um, so I guess to answer your question, it's sort of a balance. If you have a really serious pest problem, I certainly wouldn't keep any of the plant debris in your gardens. If you have a very low pest problem, I would say um, keep it around your gardens and that would allow any of the beneficials to come back. So if I'm understanding you, uh, what you're saying is that you have to find your own balance of getting rid of the, uh, the, the, uh, the raw materials or the roughage or the residue uh, versus uh, the benefit of keeping it for, um, for, for harboring the, the beneficials or for um, like um, to re as amendments in the, in the bed. Um, how tolerant um, are your clients to, um, to pests damage on their vegetables? Uh, do, do your vegetables need to be perfect or they know it's organic and they're gonna have little bites and imperfections here and there? That's a great question. So we have a couple different, we wholesale to restaurants and retail stores. And in those cases, um, really zero blemish tolerance. Uh, we also have a CSA and there, that tolerance is a little bit lower because they know they're basically seeing the process through and through. But um, our own tolerance on our plants, I, I would say is probably fairly, uh, I guess maybe medium. Um, we won't go in and like spray a bunch of stuff if there's um, like 90% of the crop with a couple holes here and there. But if a lot of the crops are really getting damaged, then we'll go in and we'll, we usually start out with something that's not going to kill the beneficials to try to at least help them. Um, so like neem oil or dish soap works really well for thrips and aphids. Um, but our tolerance level has certainly had to change over the years as we were establishing this system of growing. We've definitely tilled in crops that were seriously damaged that we didn't really wanna till in because we didn't wanna spray it with anything because we were establishing a beneficial population. So our tolerance was a lot higher the first couple of years and now it's quite a bit lower because the pest population is a lot more under control. Our beneficial population is a lot higher now, and that's a perennial population, so we can really rely on it every year. So you said you do restaurants. Um, what was the other uh, restaurants, a farm stand, mm -hmm. CSA? Uh, we, yeah, we have a 90-person CSA, and then we also sell to um, retail accounts, like a, a couple grocery stores. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. And Elise, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about intercropping. Is that something you practice? Yeah, so intercropping is definitely a little bit more work, but it's it's really worth it in the end to have something like alyssum or marigolds in your garden or on the farm in your crops. Um, it's well it's nice for the eye on a farm for sure but in your garden if you're interplanting and it's something low growing and fairly low maintenance it's really um a very cheap alternative to buying all the sprays and fungicides and whatever else you're going to put on your garden um just having some really i mean i recommend to listen to everybody because it's it's easy it's smaller it doesn't take up a lot of room and it really does attract a whole slew of um beneficials, especially the parasitic wasps. Great. And then can you can if you can... what, what is it, a lithium? Oh. Alyssum. Um, so it's in the, uh, it's a lobularia is the Latin name. It's the, just a little, it's, there's white, purple, and I think there's a pink one now, but it's just a little white flower. Um, it's kind of mounding and it, pretty much goes from eight to 12 inch spread. And it just has these little um, kind of globe flowers on it and they smell like honey. I was wondering if you could speak to some of the predatory insects and do they have different seasons that they're mostly out and about? Yeah, um, so 
we rely a lot on ladybugs, parasitic wasps. Um, we do use nematodes, which are um, more of a soil dwelling um, organism that we actually put into our watering system and it goes as a soil drench. And they eat usually the pupa or the eggs of the bad guys. Um, but that's something that we have to actually buy in. That's not a, that's not a perennial beneficial, but um, ladybugs don't love it hot. And so in the greenhouses, we usually do ladybugs in the spring or the fall and parasitic wasps are usually around all summer. So you can really rely on them in zone five for good control throughout the season. Okay. Do you, um, when you said, I, I noticed in your film, you said you, you open up the doors and let the good beneficials in. But when you open up your doors, you let the, also the pest in. So do you, how do you uh, govern that? So we use these, um, there's the, the, they're called yellow sticky cards and we put those all through the greenhouses and they're yellow because that is the most attracting color to a lot of pests, not all of them, but the majority like um, aphids, fungus gnats, thrips are all attracted to it. And so we use those cards and we basically go around on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis and circle all of the bad pests. And once we hit our tolerance number and <clears throat> it's not, going down at all you know we'll track it then we'll we'll either bring in a, a beneficial like ladybugs you can really bring into your greenhouse um and just try to get that population up and going but yeah to get a beneficial population you do need food for the beneficials and so yeah in that case you will you will have some pests in a home garden, it's a little bit more, your tolerance level is gonna be a bit lower, I would say. In a greenhouse that's 100 feet by 30 feet, there's going, there's bound to be pests here and there just because there's so many different varieties. And so our tolerance level is a little bit, um, a little bit higher probably than the home gardener. Do you have problems with earwigs? Ah, earwigs. Yeah, they are, um, yeah, they can really brutalize a crop, especially basil. For earwigs, we actually use diatomaceous earth, and that is a, it's like a powdery clay substance that you can sprinkle on your soil, um, and that usually handles earwigs or ants pretty well. But doesn't that kill bees? What does, was that? Does that injure bees? Nope, because it's on the soil. So you're not putting it on the plant anywhere. It's just on the soil, on the ground, in a little ring around your plant. They eat our pole beans as soon as they sprout. They hear bricks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's how you want to put it on the ground because they won't go through the ring of diatomaceous earth and then they won't climb on the plants. Good, thank you. Thanks, and I'm gonna pass the mic over to Caro. Go ahead, Caro, you have the mic. Can you hear me? I know my internet connection's not great. We got gotcha. you. Um, okay, great. Um, Awesome, this, is, this has been really interesting, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you ha could recommend some particular research, um, resources for farmers who are interested in kind of researching the best plant species for their specific area. I mean, I know that kind of choosing the right mix of um, species can sort of depend on your, your region. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if you have good resources like websites or books that you'd recommend to this, this group. Um, let's see, we, um, we read, what is it, No-Till, I think it's by Ben Hartman, we read his book was really helpful, um, I'm blanking on, it's been a little crazy at the nursery these past couple of days, um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of resources out there, um, a lot of seed places that you would buy your seed from in your area generally are a great resource, 
Um, we use Fedco. They have a really nice website. They have a lot of um, information on their website. Johnny's Selected Seeds, which is in Maine, has a wonderful growers library. They have a lot of information on um, what does well around here in terms of planting times. They have a lot of good stuff on succession planting um, for any of your vegetables. Um, Bluebird Nursery has a lot of really good information on all of their perennials and what works in what zones. Great. And someone asked if you avoid planting certain colors of flowers like red or yellow to um, avoid attracting some insects that might be pests. Um, not necessarily, no, we don't. Um, we do know that some plants attract a lot more pests than others. So those are plants that we're checking a lot more often, like Calabricoa um, really always attracts aphids or Brussels sprouts really always attract aphids. So there's certain plants that we are more um, observative of what's going on on the underleaf to make sure that if there is a explosion of a population, we can either remove that plant or, or take any other steps needed to reduce the population. Do you, um, do you plant trap bids uh, or, or bait bids, you know, like, uh, and then do you intersperse like, um, uh, uh, what was the one called, no, well, I forgot the name of it, but it's, um, it's a pest uh, repellent plant, a nasturtium throughout your beds, how do you, how do you mix your plants that are uh, uh, pest repellent in, in with your regular outdoor beds? Yeah, so we do use banker plants. We use a lot of salvia as a banker plant because that attracts a lot of pests. And, um, you know, you can, there's a lot of different ways to use a banker plant. You can use it as something that you're watching over to see how many pests you have. You can use it to attract the pests away from your actual crops and that's the one plant you're spraying. So if you are using any sort of sprays and you don't want to use them on your food, you're going to plant a plant that the pests like more to attract them to that plant and then you're just going to spray that plant instead of you know spraying all your nice produce so we do use salvia um that does a really good job scarlet I runner bean does a really good job of kind of absorbing pests calabricoa does a great job of taking any aphids that are in your beds and they love calabricoa so if you're planting that near something that has aphids they're going to go to the calabricoa and off of your vegetables and then you can deal with it in whatever way that you need to, to, to kill those aphids. How do you spell that? Uh, C-A-L-I-B-R-O-C-H-O-A. I think, I think I did that right. <laughs> Calibracoa. Oh, C Could you spell that again, please? I'm gonna um, try to type it into the chat here. Okay. And then you put um, pest deterrents throughout your beds, but not necessarily the ones that they like, but do you do like a nurse, um, um, what's that called, nasturtium and things like that throughout your bed, like marigolds and stuff like that throughout your beds? Um, we don't, we usually don't because it would take a long time to get all those in there and um, yeah, for in terms of like a deterrent plant, we don't only because we're on such a large scale, but I think that would work really well um, in a garden or, or smaller beds. We mostly, instead of the deterrent plants, we plant the attracting plants. So, and that's probably again, because we already have a population of beneficials in our, in our garden beds. We didn't really start doing this until, you know, a couple of years ago so we're still really kind of figuring it out also but we are seeing pretty significant changes in our pest population so I know it's working really well. And one of our guests has asked if you can speak more about blue beetles on kale and methods to control blue beetles. I actually don't know much about blue beetles. We have a lot of kale um, damage done by flea beetles. Is that what you're talking about? 
Could be. Yeah, so flea beetles are a really big problem in one of our fields. Um, so a lot of the times we're actually just going to cover them with this fabric cloth cover called Rime. And we pretty much plant the plants in the ground, put metal hoops over them, and just cover the plants with the Rime until they're so big that they're pushing against the Rime and then we take the Rime off um, because at that point damage to the plant won't um, contribute to any um, growth stunting. Uh, so we use an actual physical barrier to keep pests that are a huge problem that we haven't been able to control uh, off our plants. Hi, I have a question about the cucumber beetle. Um, I have often used Rime over my cucumbers as soon as I plant them. And I have found that the cucumber beetle will actually come up from the ground and attack the plant under the reme. Huh. Uh, huh. That's where I've used nematodes and have had very good success with nematodes, but I, I don't know, I'm, I'm iffy about the reme. It just doesn't always seem to work for me because they seem to come up from the ground. Huh. Um. Yeah, that's interesting. It might be, it might actually be a vine borer that you're having a problem with. Um, but just when you're covering your things like cucumbers and melons and squash, you just want to make sure that you're uncovering the plants when they start to flower right, so that they right. get pollinated. Yeah. Thank you. And we have another question. Um, do you have a nice reference for identification of plant pests and likewise beneficial insects? Uh, yeah, let me see what that reference is called. And I might keep to that. One great resource is the Xerxes Society. I'll go ahead and put mm -hmm. a link in there. Also, the UMass Extension and the Yukon Extension both have pretty amazing uh, resources that are available to anybody for free. They're agricultural extensions that are funded by the universities and all of their research is totally free and available to um, anybody that's interested. And so our pest and beneficial guide came from the Yukon Extension website. Um, they have an awesome colored, um, you could print it out, but it's just a colored site of all the pests and all the beneficials. Um, and the UMass extension is really good to constantly watch or get their emails if you're interested. They're usually posting about when things are being seen in their research greenhouses, which does generally um, coincide with exactly what's going on in our farm fields. So that's a really good resource also. Anyone else with another question? Feel free to take yourself off. How long did it take you to get up and running uh, your farm where you, you were turning a profit? Like I'm in an area where at minimal you need to make 70,000 clear a year. So mm -hmm. I don't know, it might be cheaper where you're at, but how long did it take you to really get it going? Five years, seven years? What did you um, we started um, actually being able to pay ourselves at about three years and we started being able to uh, turn a profit and have employees at about like six years I would say okay. so we're we're right about there um, I think last year was the first year when we decided that our career choice was a good one <laughs> <laughs> what did you do uh, during that, those lean years or those years that were um, uh, not so prosperous? Did you work jobs or what did you do? Yeah, we both had side jobs. Um, we have a, um, a large community that is very uh, wealthy around us. And so a lot of times when we were in need of something or there was something that um, was necessary to us moving on, we would usually reach out to, um, you know, the a craft list or something like that, or, or talk to our neighbors and um, 
we really built the things that we have in a very MacGyver-like way. And over the past year or two, we've been reinvesting a lot into those things to make them a little bit more efficient and actually, um, you know, work. But we get a lot of stuff just from the property. We built both of our barns with the trees that we took down in order to put the barns up. Um, so a lot of ingenuity, a lot of rice and beans. <laughs> I have a question on amendments. What amendments are you using in the soil? We use a lot of compost. Um, we generally, on a hundred foot bed, we use about two, um, sometimes three wheelbarrows of compost on the beds, depending on how many successions we're going to get out of that bed. And so because we're only, um, we live in an area where land access is really difficult. And so we have just about an acre of cropping land that we're able to grow on. So we really have to get the most out of the beds that we're using. Um, so a lot of compost. Every so often we do have to use lime to um, get our pH accurate. If your pH in your soil is inaccurate, it doesn't, I mean, of course it matters, but it doesn't matter as much about anything you're putting in your soil. If your pH isn't accurate, your plants just won't utilize what's in your soil. So pH is a really important thing to get right. And you can send soil samples to um, Logan Labs is a good one. You can also send them to um, the UMass soil testing facility. It's pretty cheap and really worth it to do. We do it once a year um, in a garden, probably once every three years is sufficient. Um, sometimes we have to add a sulfo mag. What is and, that? Um, it's a sulfur magnesium. Um, yeah. If we're doing, you know, potatoes or onions, that's something good for the soil. But usually when you send in your soil test, they'll actually give you recommendations, um, which is really nice to, to have at your fingertips. I was wondering if I could ask um, about the different uses for landscape fabric and, you know, versus a silage tarp or a heavy black tarp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've tried a couple of different tactics. So, of course, landscape fabric is really expensive, and that was something that we weren't willing to invest in for a while. So we tried the, um, it's like a plastic that is made of corn and it's um, biodegradable. We tried that, um, it was not successful. We tried black plastic and we just couldn't get around the, um, it didn't, our morals didn't support the black plastic. So the landscape fabric was really the next best thing. Um, it is a bit expensive, but it works really, really well. Um, that's what we generally put on our permanent beds. So our perennial beds, um, our perennial flower beds, our perennial herb beds. We use the landscape fabric. Also on fields that are gonna have something with the same spacing all the time because we burn holes in the landscape fabric. Um, so we put it on our brassica beds because we usually, if there's not brassicas in it, it's usually tomatoes, and then it lays fallow for a little bit. So those both have the same spacing. Um, the silage tarp is really nice. It's super, super heavy. So it's not always the best option if you don't have um, a couple of good hands to help you move it, but it does work really well to kill anything that you're trying to plant into. So that's something that you would move towards if you were doing low or no till, or you just didn't have a rototiller on hand, you're pretty much smothering out um, anything that's there. How long, Another thing, take, how long does it take to smother? Um, it depends on what's under there. If it's perennial weeds, it's going to be a bit longer. If it's annual weeds, um, it'll be a little shorter. We leave it on anywhere from like three to seven weeks. Do you cover a whole field with it? Um, we have 100 by 100 pieces. So we cover just um, small portions of the beds um, at a time. So it's not a, it's not a whole field for us, but it's a, it's a big portion of it. You said three to seven 
what? Days? Weeks? Oh, sorry. Three to seven weeks. Weeks. Someone asked if it can kill hostas. <laughs> <laughs> hostas. Hostas, you're really going to want to try to dig the root system out because they're tuberous. Um, so perennial weeds are, are pretty difficult to kill with a um, surface covering tactic. You really do need to dig them out. And another reason that it's really nice to use something on your surface like landscape fabric is um, what we use for this. But, you know, when you're planting your garden, you have a surface level of weeds or grass or whatever is on there and you destroy that in order to plant but underneath your soil surface there's also years and years of weed seeds down there so anything you can do to kill the surface things without bringing up any of the weed seeds that are lingering underneath the surface it's going to benefit you, especially if you're doing something on a large scale, because any amount of work you can cut out when your crops are growing, you're going to try to do that. So if you're killing what's on the surface and you're not bringing up the new weed seeds, it at least gives your crops a little bit more time to thrive before, you know, the annual weeds or perennial weeds set in again. What, um, as far as those weed seed banks, so you don't want to stir those up. What do you think of like a hay or something as a mulch instead of like I'm with you. I don't believe that you should you should say that you're organic and then you're using all these products of fossil fuels to leave a gigantic carbon footprint on the planet. You know, like all the plastics involved and vinyls and everything else. They're toxic as well as they they are not sustainable. So what do you think of like uh, some type of organic mulch uh, from yeah, the I mean, site I think itself mulch, where you have a, like Yeah, mulch is a like great, that. great tactic. The only thing with mulch is that it breaks down pretty fast. And if that's something you're looking for, it's a great thing to use. Um, it, when we are mulching, so we have a big pick your own at our farm for the CSA members to come pick um, flowers, um, annual cutting flowers or herbs. And in those beds, we do cardboard and then hay on top of the cardboard. And that just gives us a little bit more time between weedings. Um, and that's space that we just haven't covered with landscape fabric because like I was saying, it's expensive. And if you're having a lot of people walking on it, it's gonna degrade it a lot faster. So we choose to use cardboard and hay in the aisles of those beds. <clears throat> hay itself is a great one. It just, um, if you have anything like quack grass or any other really uh, invasive perennial weeds, um, hay just won't work for that long. I find that the uh, cardboard and hay works extremely well in the garden but not necessarily in the fields. Yeah, yeah, I guess it depends on what your weed pressure is. What have you found? Um, I'm sorry. What? Yeah, I was just gonna say, it also depends on what's handy. You know, like hay is handy for us. Cardboard is really handy because our seedling business, um, we get a lot of things in cardboard. So they're really handy to use and we have, um, hands now to help us lay it down, but it is, it's very labor intensive. What have you found in your, your journey, your farming journey to be most effective? Seminars, webinars, uh, reading books, talking to experts. If you were to say, like from the top four things that have allowed you to really do this, what would you say the, the four um, learning tactics that have helped you the most? Yeah, um, I, the top of the list is trial and error for sure. Um, that's going to be your biggest lesson teacher. If, you're, if you fail miserably at something, you're not going to do it again. Um, also, yeah, we utilize, we have a pretty sweet local farm scene around here. We're super lucky, but we definitely utilize other farmers. Um, and there's certainly some farmers that are, interested in sharing their knowledge and there's some that aren't but I think that we learn a lot from asking other people what they're doing 
um, reading a lot of books. Uh, there's a lot of books out there that can help you. And um, we follow um, Connor Crickmore is a really awesome resource. He has some really fantastic lessons. He does a lot of stuff to spread knowledge about how he's doing things. He's in New York, so a lot of the stuff that he is doing is pertaining to um, what we're doing down here because it's a similar uh, climate. Um, so I guess trial and error is the first, um, finding a mentor or a local farm that isn't hard to go to and, and sit down and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and just talk about what's happening or um, yeah, utilizing the internet to see other really successful farmers and sort of read up on how they're doing things. Speaking of mentoring, are you opening, are you open to mentoring people? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to have any questions asked. Um, this specific season has been um, outrageous in terms of um, uh, work to try to do everything correctly and safely. So I, I can't say I'm readily available this season, but um, during the winter, for sure, I'm happy to help plan succession, seed hunt, um, answer any questions. And I'm sure in the fall, I'll be in the same situation to happily answer any questions um, for sure. And, and in coming seasons, if there's not a global pandemic, I'm sure that I'll be readily available for any questions or um, even if you just need somebody to tell you you're doing a great job because that always goes a long way. I happen to be in Hamilton. I didn't know if it would be easy to stop by and just, just take a look at your farm. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, definitely. Give me, a, shoot me an email if you're ever interested. Thank you. And I've found a lot of great mentors um, from the Eastern Mass Craft, the Collaborative Regional Alliance for Farmers, uh, Farmer Training. And it's a listserv and they are very active as well as if you're in Western Massachusetts, there's a Western Massachusetts craft listserv and they host meetings when meetings are possible to learn from each other. Yeah, those craft visits are amazing. Um, you, excuse me, will get something out of it every time if it's either out of the lesson or just by networking with the people that are there. Um, those are those are super, super awesome to go to if you can make it. Mm -hmm. so you, do you do manual control where you go with your, uh, your workers and you pick off pests or do you just use like neem oil sprays and and other maybe, do you, I don't think, do you use tobacco as, um, you can't use tobacco, but do you use like manual control where you pick off pests or you don't? It depends on the pest. For a tomato hornworm, yes, we will go through and pick them all off. Um, if it's leaf miner, yes, we'll pick off the leaves that have been affected to get the new eggs out of the field. Um, if it's something like a flea beetle or, um, aphids not necessarily no we don't we don't spend the time to do that um if it's a leaf borer i'm sorry a vine borer then we will usually try to dig around in the soil um because usually you can see the plants that they've started on before they really start copulating and affecting the plants around them so we'll usually if we can catch it in time dig around the plant and try to squish all those guys um grubs we will usually manually pick out because um, again you can usually find them in a more um, they're usually in an area that's a smaller before they affect a large amount so observation is a huge part of our um, pest program disease program also but yeah observation is is big time field walks at least twice a week um, we do we do train all of our employees on, on what to be observant of the first couple of weeks. And so anytime anybody's in the greenhouse, they're always observing what's going on and, and they'll report any problems that they see. And that program took a long time to set up, <clears throat> but now that we have it set up and in action, it does work really well. Uh, by the way, you've been really, really, really great. I've enjoyed this so much. It's like I go to a lot of, well, I used to go to a lot of workshops and seminars 
And uh, you've just covered so much, I guess, because you're actually doing it rather than just mm -hmm. writing a book about it. So yeah. Really great. Thank you. Thanks. And with that, I'd like to finish up and respect everyone's time. Um, so thank you again so much for joining us. And if you found this event inspiring and helpful, please consider becoming a member or making a donation. Thanks again to our sponsors, the New England Biolabs uh, Foundation and Dr. Bronner's for helping us continue to deliver these free resiliency skills online gatherings. If you have suggestions about topics we should cover, you can send them to me via email, which is doug at nofamass.org. Next Friday at um, 5.30 p.m., I believe, we will be hosting Laura Davis and Anna Gilbert Muhammad to learn more about um, an introduction to managing soil fertility and understanding your lab soil test reports. As well, we'll um, we've moved our summer conference online and we'll be spreading it out over four weeks and we'll have similar seminars like this and um, ability to come together online. So you can find out more information about that on our website, nofamass.org. Thank you again and I hope to see you next time.